Good afternoon. My name is Laura James and I'm the Legal Director at the Howard League for Penal Reform. Um, I would like to welcome you all this afternoon and especially our, our colleague Patrice Lawrence, award-winning writer primarily of young adult fiction and also a really valued member of our advisory board, um, which is supporting uh, us to prepare a guide for lawyers to make sure black lives matter in the criminal justice system. So thank you so much for joining us, Patrice. Um, I have absolutely loved reading your books and actually so have some of my colleagues at the house because we chose RAT as our first ever book club um, choice, which was brilliant. So um, thank you for that. Um, I'm going to really try and avoid any spoilers in this conversation today so that other people can get to enjoy your books as much as I have. Um, so please uh, stop me if I'm going too far. <laughs> but um, I just wanted to start really with many of your books really explicitly deal with criminal and social justice issues. And why is that? Well, I was thinking about this sort of earlier this year because I was a writer in residence for Writing on a Wall, which is a kind of creative writing social justice um, organisation um, based in Liverpool. So actually, I think the real core of it is I'm a bit like Incredible Hulk. I'm just like angry all the time. And I'm an angry writer and angry about um, I suppose, social injustice. And I think you sometimes have to plough that anger somewhere or else it just takes you over. And for me, it's in writing. And when I was sort of thinking about this, this sort of session we, we were doing to, uh, together and thinking about stories, I was thinking about how we create the stories around our lives and the things that when we look back are little stepping stones to what we do. So it kind of might be the same for you, you know, about why you took law and then went to the private practice and the things that you thought you couldn't change the private practice. So, you know, went into, into this sort of voluntary sector to, to change. And I was looking back at some of the sort of little things actually in my life where I crossed with, I suppose, people who represent the criminal justice system. And, you know, I was always, you know, I never, well, if I did anything wrong, I'm not gonna tell you, but, you know, I remember <laughs> thinking, for instance, uh, once when I was about 19 and I was um, serving burgers behind a bar at, the, I think it was the um, Epsom Races for a friend and a police officer came up to um, order a burger and looked at me and said, oh, you've been standing too close to the grill. And I remember thinking, yeah, this is something a five-year-old says, but this is, you know, a police officer and what they represent. And you know, I worked for a little while for the um, official solicitors um, department, which was part of the um, Lord Chancellor's department when they had one prior to Ministry of Justice, where we supported um, children usually going through contentious adoption and, and, and sort of wardship and sort of phoning a solicitor. This is when I was like 23 and fresh from Sussex and not living in London yet. And phoning a solicitor to find out where his clients were, because I supposed to be interviewing them. They were a black family, professional family, I think solicitors. And he said, that's what we call uh, CPT. And CPT, oh, was it a, a colored people's time? <laughs> so I had to sort of say very <laughs> sweetly and politely and calmly sort of throw it into casual conversation at my mum's from Trinidad. So when you sort of look back, but I think because any minoritized community, whatever you are, you're kind of used to these little, I suppose what you'd call a microaggression. So you ignore them as you go, you know, it would just affect you too much. But actually, maybe there's certain times in our lives when we feel a bit stronger and we don't feel we have to be in denial. And then we think, what do we do with it? So for me, a lot of it, I plough into books. So, you know, worked in a voluntary sector for over 20 years, particularly with um, families and children, sometimes through child protection and social services work, through um, working with families of prisoners and sort of criminal justice policy, children's policy. Um, I um, also, my own biological father was in uh, prison for just a month when, for forging a check, I think, but saw the impact that had on his life in terms of not being able to work, homelessness, sort of mental health issues and sort of a, a premature death. So I think all of these, these things have come together at a time in my life when I feel able to reflect on them and think I'm going to throw them into a story. So that's, I think that's in a nutshell why. That's, that, that's really interesting. And I suppose one of the things that um, I've also picked up, um, and in particular, my daughter's really enjoyed some of your some of your other books, is not, not all of them are expressly kind of touching on some of those angry issues, if you, if you like, the criminal justice side of things. But 
um, identity and exclusion um, always seems to be there, even Diver's Daughter about um, set in Tudor times and um, and your brilliant reimagining of Mallory Towers, which I have to confess is the book that made me cry the most. Oh. Um, <laughs> I, I, how, how do you actually weave those sort of racialized identities and the sort of patchwork of human experience into your work? I think I start now with the premise that the main characters that I'm going to write about are going to be uh, black or mixed heritage. Um, and I think a lot of that obviously comes from me growing up and there is nobody like me in books, apart from some incredibly racist illustrations by Hugh Lofting for Dr. Doolittle, which I kind of looked at when I was six, looking at these sort of images where the king and queen in Africa looked like um, orangutans, basically, and trying to work out, is this what people like me look like in books. So that kind of tells you that you don't belong in books and that you don't write books. And it took me a very long time, you know, into my thirties before I overcame that. So I just thought, you know, no young person should feel that, that they shouldn't be in books, but actually we should reflect their reality. So, you know, if I'm writing black hole mixed heritage people in books, it's not gonna be, I suppose what sometimes real friends call like a coloring in exercise, where you sort of give them a name that signifies they're from other, but then they actually, their lives are the same as sort of the white majority. So you want young people, or I want young people to read my books and think, oh my gosh, that happened to me. Or, you know, oh yes, yeah, somebody gets it and feels seen. So there's something I think just feeling really special if you're that person who's on the outside and you feel seen and validated and you're there, it just makes you feel important. And I think, you know, I grew up in a very, um, <laughs> even for 70 Sussex, but a very unusual type family. So my first family was a white foster family in, in Brighton in the 70s, who were lovely and, you know, taught me to read. And then in uh, Sussex and Hayward Heath, it was my mum and my Italian stepdad who weren't married. And that's even weirder than being Italian and an Italian in the 70s, you know, everybody was married. Um, so I've always grown up in alternative families um, and you quite often see them problematized in books and whatever, but that, was, that wasn't a problem for me. It was like rich material to sort of grow on. So I know there's all these different types of identities and experiences that you can draw on. So why would I not want to write about it? You know, and I've got all of those other lives that I could steal and write about vicariously <laughs> put them in my books. That, that, that's that's brilliant and it, it sort of really feeds into the next question that I, I had down to ask you which was a, really what you what you want young readers to really get out of out of your work and I mean you've already of course mentioned being able to to see see themselves in it but is there anything else that you think is important for young readers to well, experience from your work? I mean there's lots of things I think children and young people have so little agency over their lives you know, someone else to, to sort of decides if and where, you know, they will go to school, you know, what they learn in school, who they will sit next to in school, you know, every element of their, their life is decided, you know, what media they consume, what's on telly, what's all of these things. Mm -hmm. um, so actually being able to write stories from either, whether it's uh, from picture books to, to books with, with um, young adults at the centre, it's a way of giving young people back some agency so they can do things in books because um, young people just have so little control over their everyday lives. They have to generally follow what adults do. Their voices are quite often squashed down, I think. And particularly, you know, certainly as you know, you know, vulnerable young people as well um, who are caught up in different types of systems, their voices are, are sort of, uh, particularly if they're judged as well. And I mean, that in a wider sense, you know, the young people who are seen as wanting and seen as if they don't deserve an equal place in society their voices are damped down so much, aren't they? And I think what you can do in books is you can give young people experiencing, of experiences experienced those issues, humanity and a voice. And, you know, books have always done that. I think they've always, you know, thinking back to when I was doing, you know, pre-GCSEs, I did like O-levels, we did uh, To Kill a Mockingbird. Mm -hmm. And even though you're kind of sitting there like the only black kid in class and they're going to say the N-word, and you think, oh, please, you know. But actually also what it did at that time was give the black characters humanity you know, at a time of great sort of, um, you know, of segregation and sort of criminal injustice. Mm -hmm. And books have always done that. They've been able to give people humanity. And I think even when I was working um, for the official solicitors as a, a children's caseworker, you know, part of your job was writing a report to the judge. 
And there you are creating a narrative, aren't you? You're creating a narrative of that child's life and a family experience that you want the judge to believe, to make an order in your favor. So what you're doing is creating humanity and narratives that you want to sort of slightly tilt the world, I think. And actually what you say there about the squashed, the squashing down of children's voices, the lack of agency, the writing, the narrative, you know, actually I recognize all of that from the work that we do every day in, in the legal team at the Howard League, you know, we are constantly trying to, you know, get behind the the paper that's the sort of some of the worst thing that the child has ever done and find find that child there. And I think some of those little details about that that human side of things that you've just talked about in your books it really just rings true I think one of the things that really really struck with me um is the um is in in Orange Boy Marlon's mom just what a lovely mom <laughs> just a lovely mom but 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 also the bit I think early in the book where where he ends up in the police station and you're just talking about his experience with the GT solicitor and you just sort of say oh you know and Darren or was it Daniel or you know and and that's the sort of thing that I hear from children every day or who represented you at the police station or I don't know I can't remember their name and the way you just get that kind of very granular detail across of what the experience for children is in the criminal justice system and I suppose I'm interested actually how you get that level of detail and why you think it's so important in a way. I think for me when you're writing characters who are part of groups that have experienced discrimination and, and judgment you really have to think about it and I think with Orange Boy you know you, you, it could be seen that I'm writing about a young black boy who gets involved in crime so that's every stereotype klaxon going and of course once you write a book you can't control it so you can't control how other people perceive it so I could say it's this this and this so what I say about Orange Boy is that you've got three sets of brothers, um, all dealing with legacies from other brothers, but they've all got different amounts of social capital. So Marlon, who's obviously tells a story, you know, he's got his mom, who's a librarian. She's got kind of an affluent white boyfriend. Um, and even though she really struggles with it, there is some degree of social capital there. She can get to the um, police station. She can get to the school. She's articulate. She can articulate. She can advocate for her own. You know, she's got that. Whereas at the other end, you've got sort of Dias, who's, you know, his mum who didn't have agency herself, and he's kind of left to it. And his character was inspired by a book called Prisoner of the Streets, written by Robin Travis, who's become, you know, quite a, an author now and, and a real sort of a sort of spokesperson for what happens for for young people who sort of experience these difficulties and he wrote like it was like a memoir about how he grew up in Tottenham and Hackney how he got involved in gangs and in, in Hackney and one of the details that really struck me was when he was 15 and he had nowhere to live so social services put him in a hostel and I know actually where that hostel is because he's been near my bus stop in Dalston but it was a hostel for the grown people with quite profound experiences and this is a 15 year old and it's a really you know <laughs> vulnerable position and I just thought oh my goodness. And it just really made me think about the different safety nets that people do or don't have. So I thought it was really important that Marlon actually does have some privilege in his life in terms of what mm. he could do, but he's still finding himself pulled into it. But compared to the other, you know, the, the sort of the ice in his brother taste, it, it, yeah. it's, there's nothing. So I thought it was really important to make Marlon very nuanced and very relatable and just as far from a stereotype as I can, while still exploring the issues around prejudice, stereotype, and what's get, what gets projected onto young black people and what sticks in spite of their total humanity. And, and absolutely the kind of, the, those kinds of different gradients of um, care and support that young people have um, is, is just so important. And, you know, we see that as well in our work with this huge increase in young people, just 18 being put in approved premises for much older adults, which is really distressing. Um, so, and I think the, the other thing I, I I just wanted to talk a little bit actually about Indigo Donut, which um, I've only read for the first time recently or listened to actually, I have to say, I listened to Ben Bailey Smith and it's brilliant, brilliant reading of it. And I absolutely love the book. But 
Um, first of all, it was really sh it was great to have a. I mean, you've written lots of books with girls as as main characters, which is I think really important because I think sometimes in the narratives that we've been talking about, sometimes boys really dominate that. And um, certainly, one of the good news stories in the criminal justice system is the reduction in the number of girls. Mm -hmm. um, but but still, you know, there's lots and lots of really important issues issues there. Um, and what was really interesting about that book is nothing. Um, desperately trying hard not to do any spoilers here but the the involvement with the criminal justice system for her as as somebody in contact with the police doesn't kick in till very very late in the book by which time you've really got to know and really like her I think she's a really lovable character um and um I won't, I won't say exactly what happens but um and it just seems to be so important to have built up that relationship with her and her thinking and what she likes and her fears and hopes and and her background and I suppose I was just thinking what what do you think lawyers police officers judges people you know people sort of in the system can get from reading your books I think there's how we look at the whole of someone I think I mean Indigo is I think one of my favorite characters but again because I was writing about a young person whose care experience you know my measure is I want a reader whose care experience to pick up that book and think you know that writer gets it so you're not sort of having something that's sort of overly hopeful in a way that's actually impossible because if you've lived in like if you've been shuttled around to 12 13 14 different placements across the the country and if you haven't got a relationship with your your biological family for whatever reason and suddenly you hit 17 and suddenly, you know, you're supposed to go into, at that time, you're supposed to like leave your foster uh, family and go into, into sort of, sort of semi-supported housing or whatever. What, what do you do? How do you, how do you manage it? So I really wanted to express that through, through Indigo, but also the circumstances that eventually we find out about how she ended up in, in sort of uh, care as well. And I think it's, I think it's what you were saying earlier is that you want, sort of people who encounter young people who are struggling, not just to respond to that behavior that you see at that time, whether it's anger, wherever the anger might come from, whether that's fear, which might drive the anger, whether it's cynicism, which I think some young people are really not surprised if they're cynical. I want them not to respond to that, but think of that, that human behind it. But, you know, that's a young person that like, like music or fashion, who's, you know, has, crushes, can love people as well as hate people, has desires, has hopes, has aspirations, which way may have been crushed, and to actually see that behind the anger as well. I think one of the things that kind of really troubles me about the, the system, as it were, is sometimes you don't even get the chance to find out about um, a young person's background or experiences until, until they get really quite deep into it. And I had an experience just the other day, actually, with the young person who we've been working with the for, for several years and it was only when a particularly powerful criminal justice event happened that we got lots more information about his background which opened up conversations which totally changes the picture mm -hmm. uh, so you know it, it feels like that scratching the surface and it feels like we all need to maybe be be better writers historians and and better at communicating. And so, so there's actually so there's it's actually an organization called the Empathy Lab, which um, each year builds together a collection of books for children and young people. And they sort of uh, you know promote those as books that promote empathy because we know that you know stories can promote empathy, they can change our opinion about other people. So it's not only about seeing ourselves, it's about seeing other people. And I think books can provide a safe space for that because I think we all do hold prejudices and we all do you know because they've never been challenged so you know before I moved to London I'd never met somebody who was L out as LGBTQ because growing up in 70s and 80s that would have been dangerous you know you know where I you know where I live people would have been mm -hmm. hurt so you sort of absorb all the media stereotypes and books allow you privately to work through those stereotypes and acknowledge your own ignorance I think and what Empathy Lab does it's a big collection of books for children of all ages that you know, they encourage schools to to and librarians to um, uh, give to children to read, so that they can learn a little bit about other people's lives through through books. So, and it's again, it's about you know, for lawyers and, and the criminal justice, something also very basic about, particularly when we're looking at um, racialized identities, about how you educate yourself. It's not like there's not 
information out there. It's about how you listen to the voices of people who are marginalized as well, because, you know, we find it very hard to talk about race and racism because for much of our lives, I think the first time I talked about, I really not even talked about it in school, I was nine and um, our school decided it was going to have a production of Oliver because you know, primary school, you're gonna have a production about child exploitation and child prostitution with snappy songs, why not? <laughs> you know? um, and I just said sort of casually, I said, I, I probably I wouldn't get a part because I was black. And I didn't mean that, I wasn't assuming my teachers were racist. I'd just seen the film several times. They're like, no black folk in that film. But yeah. one of the other, um, one of my friends told her parents and they were really upset about it, about, cause they thought it was a racist thing. So they told the school and I got taken to that, to the head and the head sort of in, not, just interrogated my nine year old self. I was like, did you say this? And like, no. So you learn at a very young age not to talk about it and you hold it in. So I think there are a lot of perhaps people in the criminal justice system, perhaps people who aren't part of mixed communities, um, don't have, you know, that, that mixed friendship group, the close people that you can talk to about who don't have these conversations. So mm -hmm. they really need to find ways of having those conversations and educate themselves. I think that's really valuable, Patrice. And I think as lawyers as, as well, you know, quite often, you know, they're not always comfortable conversations to have. And it's something that we're working really you know, hard to make sure we have those conversations with the young people we represent, um, you know, who are, you know, many, as you know, there are lots and lots of particularly young black boys in, in custody. And, and there is also, as I said, also there is a class element, isn't, isn't there as well? So I think, you know, one of the things I suppose, you know, I talk about privilege of my privilege is that even though I grew up in a sort of a working class background, is that my mother grew up in colonial Trinidad. So I've got lots of points of references that, she, and my stepdad's Italian, but um, we used to go to Italy. So we used to like see, go to all the museums and art galleries, you know, seem like Botticelli. So I yeah. can have middle-class conversations. Yeah. So I can articulate, and I think for particularly for sort of young black, black people who might be involved in the criminal justice system, you're walking into a space where you might be the only black kid. You already know what that means. And if there is another person of color, they might present as somebody, not only from a different generation, but a different class as well. So you might already feel cynical that they are aligned with, you know, the majority and already against you. So there's a whole range of sort of intersections there that can impact on young black people, which again will impact on the way that they present to you, which kind of is, it ends up as a cycle, doesn't it, I think. Absolutely. And in terms of sort of accessibility, obviously you've spoken about the Empathy Lab, but are there other ways in which you're, you get your books out there, as it were, particularly to some of the young readers that you think would really benefit from them? I think one of the things is that we, in certainly for the team books, we, we literally try to have um, questions at the back that you know can be used in discussion groups and I think actually it's interesting once with with Orange Boy um my ex-husband's nephew once uh texted me because he's a supply teacher with a picture that come to the come to the lunchtime reading group and there's a big mug shot of me in Orange Boy because I'm reading as a lunchtime reading mm -hmm. group so librarians and, and sort of teachers have been fantastic in getting the books out um I know Orange Boy is in a uh, sort of um list for reading for pleasure as well so literally just getting those in, into the hands of children. Um, I think RAT, which is, um, she says wobbling. You can see it just behind yeah. your head. <laughs> I can't get my left or right. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, it could be used like as a, P PCS, a PSHE book, you know, where you can read it and think about what's it like to be a child who's angry, who's, you know, mum's been in prison and then gone back in again, you know, about food poverty. And it's the same with Rose Interrupted, actually, food poverty, you know. It brings up lots of subjects, I think, that if you wanted to encourage a conversation in a safe space, you can talk about them. But mm -hmm. I mean, for me, I think the other thing has been when I do school visits, um, I'm very honest and talk about myself. So I talk about, you know, spending my first four years in foster care. I even had a great experience, but, you know, I talk about, you know, being, um, you know, a black person in predominantly white spaces. I talk about, um, uh, how my, my father was in, in prison and how he ultimately became homeless and had mental health issues because I feel in a position to talk about that 
Um, mm -hmm. And so many young people do come up to you afterwards, either openly or very quietly to relate their experiences. So you like get a little pat on the back and go like, geez, I'm in foster care. Or, you know, a young woman, I think in, um, at one event sort of said, yeah, my dad's in prison too. And that's happened a couple of times. Or young people, when I talked about Indigo Donut at the Hay Festival, a sort of school event, um, the first people who were queuing to, to chat afterwards were young care experienced people because it's like, oh my gosh, you know, it's, it's that. So I think it's about how you get the books to lots of different readers, but then if you can, how you create conversations around those books. I think that that sounds really important. And certainly I hope, I hope some of your books are in some of the libraries where the young people we work with are in custody. So the other thing I wanted to ask you is um, what books have, you, have inspired you? Oh, that's, that's hard because um, I think the books, obviously, I was a massive reader when I was a kid, massive. But what reading did for me was, as well as inviting me into different worlds, it invited me into worlds where I didn't exist. So it had like this kind of, you know, sort of polarised thing going on where it's like, come into my world, but hey, no black people allowed, you know. So you, I sort of just absorbed that for years and years and years, you know. Um, and then I got into Stephen King books, which I'm not sure. He's <laughs> like, that tells you about the story. Um, and then when I was um, in my, actually my early thirties, I just had a baby. Um, my baby was about two weeks old and I turned on the TV and it was an adaptation of Mallory Blackman's Pig Heart Boy. And it's like, it's a black family and they're not the Cosbys and it's not Fresh Prince of Bel-Air. And literally, you know, I was saying to, to somebody the other day, if, if you've been a person who's always seen yourself, you could not understand what it's like to suddenly see yourself like that and to think, oh my gosh, I might belong. I might be able to do this. There was a place for me. So sort of Mallory Blackman definitely, because this door opened and I just thought I can use my, my sort of own experiences. And there's a lot of children's writers now that are exploring social justice issues in books and sort of older than sort of, uh, and sort of writers for sort of adults as well. So one of them, um, was a, I'm not going to move my teetering pile because I've had too many bad experiences. So um, in Boy Everywhere by uh, uh, Asda Sal, she's written a story about a, a Syrian refugee from Damascus. So she did loads of research about it, you know, sort of worked with sort of local Syrian communities in, in Leicester and, and given back. And she was just saying today, actually, that she was uh, phoned in LBC radio to debate with a man who was saying that, you know, refugees are just here to get our benefit, you know, benefits. But that book's been taken up quite a lot in schools. So, you know, this is actually a chance for a generation of young people to to understand the stories behind refugees, which bearing in mind the news today feels incredibly important. Um, Caleb Femi's um, Paul, which is Caleb is an amazing poet um, who's from sort of grew up in Peckham in, in the estate where Damalola Taylor was killed. And he's kind of written this sort of anthology of poetry about, and it's kind of celebratory, but also it's just about the realities as well. It's sort of very ly lyrical and powerful and, and sort of gorgeous. Um, there's been quite a few American books recently. Um, by US authors, um, middle grade and YA, that again, have had that element of, of learning in them. So one is called Ghost Boys by, I think it's Jewel Parker Rhodes, which is middle grade, which um, starts with a, a boy, I can't he's quite young, getting shot dead by a white policeman. I think he's, he, and he's, and it's, it's his ghost telling the stories. You've got like Emmett Till and all of those things uh, in there as well about how so many black boys get killed. Um, so it's not a cheerful book, but it's kind no. of, again, it's a sort of uh, sort of learning. So the name is, Caleb, the poet's name, sorry, is Caleb Femi. So Caleb, C-A-L-E-B, Femi, F-E-M-I, and it's called Poor, the book. Yeah. Punch in the yeah. Air sort of came out this year, which is by um, Yusuf Salam and Ibi Zaboy. And Yusuf Salam was, as a teenager, when he was 15, he's one of the Central Park Five who was erroneously accused of the sort of rape and murder of a, of a white jogger and uh he donald trump then who was you know his business this businessman paid for posters to go around new york saying you know the death penalty should be brought back for new york for people like them but they didn't do it but they were incarcerated so he worked with Ibi, who's a writer for young adults to write this verse novel and it's inspired by his experience about a 15 year old boy 
who's in the wrong place at the wrong time in a gentrified neighborhood who ends up in, in prison. But it's also about the redemptive power of art and poetry. So it's got so much, so it's much more hopeful because I was resisting it. It's like, oh no. But actually it's about art and the power of, of art as well. So there's, um, there's quite a few, and there's also Angie Thomas's The Hate You Give as well, which got made into a film, which again is about, you know, the um, experience of, of poor um, African-Americans. But I think we do need more UK stuff, because I think the American experience is very different, mm -hmm. and women's experiences are quite often left out of it, I think. I was exactly just about to say quite a lot of the names you've just given of American and male, and I was just, I mean, I you know, I'm not one to talk the diversity in, in, you know, amongst the legal profession is appalling. And, and we know that. Um, but I was interested in terms of um, diversity amongst, uh, amongst writers, really, and, and where, where you think that is at the moment, and where it's got to go. I mean, it's interesting, isn't it? Because if you look at, because I was a judge for the Costa Children's Award this year, and it was 75% female. Um, wow. Well, but I suppose if we look, if we broke it down, if we look at ethnicity, the sort of ethnic diversity in it was 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 not great. So these are books that are submitted by publishers, and I think of the sort of 150 odd books, only about four or four or five are written by Black people. So that's a very small, you know, proportion. Um, so there aren't that many. There's some more, I think, you know, uh, black writers coming through in children and young, young people. But obviously, what do we want to write about? You know, so we haven't got enough to say we want to write about this and this and this and this to have that variety. People don't always want to write about trauma. Um, they, um, I wonder as well whether women, particularly black women who have experienced imprisonment are expressing themselves in different ways. So through poetry, obviously through clean, you know, clean break, through performing mm -hmm. art and other ways. So perhaps so their, their sort of experience is coming out, but it still feels like in certain in children and young adults, uh, the experiences of black women and girls who are in the criminal justice, I can't really think of much, and certainly from a UK perspective. So some, something there. So. Um, the, the other thing I suppose I wanted to, just going back to the criminal justice system again, as I mentioned a bit earlier, the um, we all know, I mean, you know, 20 years on from, 21 years on from McPherson and, you know, four years on from the Lamy report, we know that the um, discrimination in the criminal justice system sort of manifests in its, manifests in its most acute form when it comes to to children in prison, which is what my team and I work on. And you know, one in three children in prison at the moment are black. And nine out of 10 children um, who are remanded to prison from London are black. It's just a- I mean, that's shocking, isn't it? Staggering, staggering. So, you know, we're trying to tackle this in, in our legal work. And obviously, as you know, you're on, on the board for our anti-racist guide for lawyers, but it really in lots of ways feels like we're sort of just chipping away at the very top of a massive iceberg and and something something more really is needed and I suppose I'm just interested to pick your brains on how we we can work together as a as a community really to achieve much wider change. Well I think there have always been grassroots organizations for as long as I can remember that have been working on this so you know um, sort of uh, black family organizations and all of those I think have been doing that there's I mean it's such a difficult thing I think what's frustrating is also certainly when I worked in the voluntary sector is about how few statistics there were so you knew this but for a while for instance ethnicity was measured as something like black white and Asian if you've got anything so you, you couldn't even say these are the stats look at this isn't this terrible I think we just find, need to find ways, different ways of getting the stories out there, don't we? So, you know, the work that you're doing to um, provide a guide for sort of uh, uh, lawyers and um, hopefully they'll have case studies and stories in them as well. It's like every time we go out and speak to people as well, isn't it? And then of course, it's about how we create the next generation of um, uh, lawyers and other sort of professionals in a criminal justice system as well who actually understand these experiences and, and can challenge them. Um, it's also about the, you know, the books that go into nursery schools and the picture books that's, that, that um, can challenge stereotypes um, that, are, that are already there. We want to see the books that have you know, um, black children as you know, like 
Nathan Byron and Dapad Adela got, got a little girl, a little black girl who's an astronaut, for, <laughs> for instance, you know, and it's like a UK book, you know, we want all of those sort of books that can tell children that these are your paths, these are things that you can do. So it starts so at the beginning, I think, doesn't it? And it works its way, its, its way through. And, and I suppose, you know, for some of us, um, you know, that that just feels, you know, such a long time to to have to wait, you know, if we're sort of on that on that slow journey. And um, one of the things that still seems to be um, difficult is that we still hear um, you know, members of the judiciary talking about unconscious bias and being colorblind and 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 sort of not necessarily seeing color, um, which seems to be a problem. In fact, I didn't know what your thoughts are on that. It happens a lot, doesn't it? I think when people say, oh, I'm, I'm colorblind, and people used to say, you know, that well, I don't notice that Patrice is black. And I thought, well, that actually takes away my ability to talk about my particular experiences. And it's really hard also because there's issues around power dynamics, isn't there? And it's about, you know, how can you tell somebody that's got so much power and is actually in a position of power and is looked at as in a position of power just because of their own identity, quite often as a relatively affluent white man. So, you know, at the top of the tree, you know, how do you tell them? them? And I, I think we just have to carry on as, as, as we are, really. I think there are some people who will, um, you know, looking at your advisory group, you've got such amazing people on that who are doing so many different, you know, different levels of work, the work that people do individually with the young people that they see, you know, the work that people might do around education, you know, other lawyers, the um, advocacy and activism, some of the, your sort of members do, you know, I feel honored to be part of that, just listening to what other people, you know, what other people are doing. Then we need to sort of go back and look at funding. And we need to look at how we fund grassroots organizations because certainly one of the things I found in the voluntary sector is you tended to have bigger organizations that could have paid fundraisers and all of that who were able to get the, you know, the money in. And then sometimes they might work in partnership with a grassroots organization. We need to go look back about how we um, empower grassroots organizations to work directly with young people, directly with families, and how you educate sort of families and communities about their rights as well. Because I think a lot of the time, you know, we don't know our rights, do we? <laughs> Because it's particularly if you've not sort of been um, involved in the criminal justice system. Mm -hmm. So there is, you know, there is that discrepancy, isn't there, about people just not having the money to be able to learn and teach. And then I think there's just a really big onus on the voluntary sector. And I think um, certainly my experience of the voluntary sector in London is very similar to publishing, is that it is predominantly white, predominantly middle class. It's not particularly diverse. Quite often, if you see a person of colour, they work in finance or running the diversity project. And I have run those diversity projects before. So it's actually, you know, even a bigger voluntary sector organisations like looking around themselves, because I think when you work, you know, not you, but when one works in the voluntary sector, we're very good at telling other people what they should do around equality and social justice, but not often looking at ourselves as well and how we act. So there's again, something about the diversity of experience in the bigger organizations as well, where you can have those conversations and then work out different ways that everything that you do in those organizations reflect that equality and that social justice issue, and that you all have the strength within your own work roles to challenge the injustice, because you know that you're, you've got back in, I think. So it, multiple layers. Well, it definitely feels like we've got a, a huge way to go, but it feels that um, very much that there's something to be said for y using creative methods and, and, you know, getting your stories out there. And certainly, um, you know, when when we're talking to judges and, and decision makers about young people, you know, giving them the stories and, you know, I wish I could write as beautifully as you, I obviously can't, but um being able to you can. take time to listen. <laughs> well I have a good but taking time to listen to children and um trying to um actually tell their stories we've got um a comment here in the the chat from Elspeth which says hi Patrice what wonderful work you do I love the rich honesty of your books I work with young people in dire need of this kind of reflection in a youth organization called Life Beat and we are knee deep um Oh, I've lost that. I, and we are knee deep in unearthing equality and social um, justice issues. And then she says that um, that you were friends at Warden Park, and she was. Oh loved my gosh! <laughs> um, 
how wonderful to see and hear you and feel supported by your valuable work in social justice where would you i support you that's a lovely message elspeth um, get in touch <laughs> That's you sat next to each other in English. got a message from Lib <laughs> Oh, brilliant. Great. And um, we've also got a message here from Libby saying it would be possible to have a note of the books that you mentioned, particularly the book about Syrian refugees. So we can definitely send out your, your recommendations. Um, we might, we will just check and make sure we've got a note of all of them. Yeah. We can send that to um, people after the event. Um, and we have a question here from Fen from Letterbox. Um, Hi, Patrice. I'd love to know if you have been a prison writer in residence. If not, would you want to? And would you prefer to work in a woman's or men's prison estate? That's really interesting. One of the sort of jobs, I suppose, that really changed me was um, when I first time I worked for Clinks, a criminal justice charity twice. And the first time it was part of the Arts Alliance, which is an umbrella group for organizations that um, bring arts into prisons, which is why I loved punk punching the air actually, because of the redemptive quality of arts in, in sort of in prisons. And it was, um, we had a year to um, create a creative writing uh, competition along with National Prison Radio and to target it at prisoners of lower literacy, because quite often you'd get the same, you know, writers, prison writers writing for like the amnesty and not, but to tell people that you can, you can write a story, you can tell a story, even if it doesn't matter about your spelling, that's what technology is there, yeah. you know, you can, and particularly people have been told for a long time that you can't do anything. I've been told at school that you're not good at that. You can tell a story. So we had to recruit, um, uh, writers. I had to do work in at least 20, 20 prisons, I think we did 25, and recruit writers to do um, workshops along with Guy Theatre, who like a prison theatre company, who work with masks, so they would like create characters and, and it was absolutely fantastic. And there's kind of two things that really struck me, it was one where we had um, Eileen Brown, who's an illustrator and children's writer, she did like Hand of Surprise and some others, so she did a session in Wormwood Scrubs, and I didn't sit in because I was doing something else, but I saw her afterwards and she said, the chaplain set it up. So it's in a chapel, so it's quite a safe space. She walked in and there's like um, a, a prisoner playing the piano, you know, and um, but I read some of the feedback for, from that afterwards. It was kind of heartbreaking. It was um, prisoners saying, this is the first time I felt like I've been a human being, treated like a human being since I've been in prison. And, you know, if they, you know, if they want us to be rehabilitators, treat us like people. And, you know, I've finished writing my story and I've sent it to my child. And then the second thing that struck me is we did one of the, once the competition was, was, was finished, we selected work and they were read out by prisoners in three different prisons and recorded through National Prison Radio. And one of them was in um, HMP style in Manchester, which is a women's mm -hmm. prison. And after we all came out of doing that, we were just silent because the vulnerability of those women and the difference it feels between why women are in prison, which is quite often to do with men. So it's either they were protecting men or supporting them on domestic violence or there's sort of exploitation. And, mm -hmm. and I think it was just, it, and it, but also the way that women really supported each other. You know, if one stumbled on their reading, another you know, one helped her, but it just really made me think why, what, what sort of society are we that these women are in prison? And amount, amount of them that are mothers as well. And, um, yeah, so it's, uh, and I've all, you know, I did a workshop actually just before lockdown in February with, um, Pen, it's not Pend in the Margin, it's, it's a literary festival that, that David Kendall sort of runs mm -hmm. um, and I'm writing in Downview as well. And it's exactly the same thing, you know, women are so responsive when you sort of chat to them and, you know, it's, it's, it feels such an equal relationship, but I still feel it's heartbreaking, particularly with women in prison. But I think definitely one thing I'm going to take away from today and our time is, has come to an end. I can see there's a, a comment um, from Henny Beaumont just as we're just as we're leaving, saying she's um, always looking and failing to find books um, with young adult content for um, particularly uh, for her daughter, um, who, um, and and there's a bit who who has. Um, thanks, LD, and there's a big gap in the market. And she's talking about um, even Barrington Stokes books are too difficult. So um, she's saying if you considered um, writing or even adapting one of your books. Um, so if you answer that very briefly, and then I'll wrap up if that's okay. <laughs> um, I haven't thought adapting, but I think it's, if, if, if there is a gap in the market, then, then 
um, readers as a fresh new stories, appropriate yeah. stories. So they're not adapting something new, original and fresh. Definitely. Uh, something particularly for them. Well, I think that is just, um, you know, a brilliant thing to end on. I think the takeaways I've got from here is we all need to be more creative um everybody should read your books and we should um take your <laughs> list away um and you know and i think that that is you know getting people's stories out there is actually part of that uh, wider mission for change that we all care about and um and of course I, I can't really leave without saying that if people haven't joined the howard league um then we do we would love you to join because we really do value our members and we are really keen to work together on on these kinds of projects and it just remains for me to say Thank you so much, Brigitte, and goodbye. And thank you for inviting me, Laura. Thank you, everybody. Pleasure.